welcome back. It's Thursday, December 1st. The countdown to Christmas has officially started for a lot of us. And I couldn't be more excited. I got my chocolate milk. I'm ready. Complete side note. Question for the live chat. What is your favorite drink if you have one? Um, this has nothing to do with today's episode. I'm, I'm just curious because that's a question I feel like I've never had an, uh, an answer to, right? Um, <laughs> I, I think it always depends on the, the season or the time of day, obviously. But chocolate milk has to be up there for me, man. And, and before you guys get at me saying, hey, Owen, it's got to be water. I know, I know. But let's be real. <laughs> water doesn't taste better than a lot of these other drinks that aren't healthy for you. <laughs> but I digress. Uh, before we dive into the, today's episode, I hope everyone out there is healthy and feeling good. You know, I know there's the annual flu bug that's going around. And though it's not COVID, it's never going to be fun to have. So if you are sick, do what you have to do to get normal. Do what you have to do to get healthy. <laughs> that's the most important thing, uh, especially uh, this time of year. But today is our weekly NFL coverage show. We're going to take a look at the updated playoff bracket uh, on both sides, AFC and NFC. We're going to give our picks of the week and much more typical Thursday stuff for us here. Uh, I don't want to spoil it, but we killed it with our picks last week. Out of 16 games, uh, let's just say we're well above 500. So stay tuned for that. But if you're new around here and you enjoy the show, drop a like. Subscribe to the channel and turn those post notifications on if you haven't already so you know when these drop. Um, for example, yesterday we released a podcast when we never release podcasts on Wednesdays. It's because of an announcement I had I, um, I made on the show yesterday. There was a technical issue on a in, inside the studio on Tuesday, I'll put it that way. So we had to move it to Wednesday. But if you <laughs> you would be on top of that if you had the post notifications. Anyway, without further ado, welcome to the Anomaly Podcast. I'm your host, Owen Stiftar. Let's see what Week 13 has to offer. All right, um, let's dive into the AFC side of things first, then we'll get into the NFC. Just like normal, I'm always going to have visuals up on the screen, just so you can see and follow along. Um, for the AFC, the one seed is, has stayed the same for a couple weeks now. It is the Chiefs. No surprise there, they're 9-2. and two. The 2 seed, we have the Miami Dolphins. They jumped up five spots last week, and they are still at two. So good for them. They Obviously, you can see they play the Texans this week, so we shouldn't have any change in the one and two spots. The 3 seed is where it gets interesting. The Tennessee Titans are 7-4, and four, obviously first in the AFC South, but they play the Bengals this week, who we'll get into in a second, but that could change the standings uh, by next week. But right now, no change. They're still the three spot. And for the Ravens, they're number four, leaders of the AFC North. Um, they played the Jaguars next, or they played the Jaguars last week. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I completely misread this graphic at first, so I apologize if you are confused. The Chiefs played the Rams last week. The Dolphins played the Texans last week. Same thing with the Titans and the Bengals and the Ravens and the Jags. That was Those were last week's matchups. But the one through four in the AFC, nonetheless, they haven't changed in the last week. As we move to the wild card standings in the AFC, the Bills won last week on Thanksgiving. They're still at five. No change there. The sixth seed, the Bengals are going up one spot after their win last week against the uh, against the Titans. So good for the uh, the Bengals. They look better than ever right now, and they're getting Jamar Chase back. But we'll get into that later. And the seventh seed, who they they're sneaking into the playoffs <laughs> under the power of Mike White. The Jets are the seventh seed in the in the AFC, coming off their win against the Bears. Moving over to the NFC side of things. We have no change in the top four. <laughs> no surprise there. Um, we have one. We have the Eagles. They're 10 to 1. No surprise. The two seed, we have the Minnesota Vikings, who they got a much needed bounce back win against the Bill Belichick and the Patriots. So impressive nonetheless. They're still 9 and 2. 
the three seed and four seed are the Niners and the Buccaneers. Who the Buccaneers are very interesting. Um, they have a below 500 record, but they're <laughs> right now they would have a home game in the playoffs. Crazy how the playoffs work. But for the five seed, you have the Cowboys, who remain the same after their win last week against the Giants. The Giants remain the same despite their loss to the Cowboys. They're still at the six seed. And sneaking into the playoffs is the Washington Commanders. Um, after their win last week against Marcus Mariota and the Falcons, making the whole NFC East in the playoffs. Um, we quickly forget. I mean, last year, the NFC East was a disaster. They were the complete opposite. And <laughs> they, I, I, I think obviously only one team made the playoffs last year, but the, for this whole division to make the playoffs this year, would be absolutely crazy, especially with the jokes that were said about them last season. But that's it. We don't have many changes in the playoff picture. I expect it to pick up a lot more. We get a lot more divisional games coming up, and obviously that's going to shake some things up come playoff time. But let's get into Thursday night. Uh, we have the 8-3 and three Buffalo Bills going into Foxborough to take on the 6-5 and five New England Patriots. Uh, the Bills are coming off of a Thursday night th or Thanksgiving thriller, I should say, against the Lions, which the Bills won. Uh, for this for this matchup specifically, uh, I was doing some research. Josh Allen is three and four against the Patriots in his career. He only averages about 200 passing yards, uh, one touchdown, and one pick per game. So he struggled for Josh Allen standards. We'll have to look out for that in this matchup. For the Patriots, they're coming off of a loss, This the, third, the Thanksgiving night loss to the Fal uh I can't talk right now. Let's restate that. For the Patriots, <laughs> uh, they're coming off of a loss to the Vikings on Thanksgiving, um, ultimately falling out of the seventh spot in the playoffs for now. Obviously, we still have five or six weeks to go. They can still get back there. Aside from that game, we know how great their defense has been this season. One of the best in the league, statistically and visually. <laughs> uh, but yes, I mean, they rank first in many stats defensively. A lot of the advanced stats, uh, especially. But we know how great their defense has been. They're mainly known for how stingy their run defense is. And in this matchup, the Bills don't like to run the ball a lot, right? But we know Josh Allen. He can get out there and use his legs to make a lot of plays. He's going to present this Patriots defense with a lot of challenges with his legs and his mobility. So that, that will be the key thing that I would look out for here for the Bills on the road in Foxborough. But on offense for the Patriots, they've prim primarily been a ground and pound team. That's what we've known them to be for pretty much since Brady has left, right? But the last three weeks, they're, they've, been on a pretty, they've been on a bad slide. We'll put it that way. They only average about 70 rushing yards a game, which is <laughs> bottom of the league, to say the least. But I believe they can get it going. You know, when you have the old line that they do and when you have the backs that they do in Ramondre Stevenson and Damian Harris, you'll have no problem getting it back on the ground. It'll just be tough to against this Bills defense. But look for this Bills team with Josh Allen and his mobility. Don't forget, obviously, Stephon Diggs out there causing problems. Um, look for that duo to give this Patriots defense just enough issue to pull out a close game here late on the road on Thursday night, which is tonight. So that'll be a fun game to watch. Moving on to Sunday, we have the 1 o'clock games. The 4-7 and seven Green Bay Packers headed to Soldier Field to take on the 3-9 and nine Chicago Bears. Uh, the biggest question when I take a step back and look at this matchup is, who will be the quarterbacks? <laughs> you know, with Aaron Rodgers having the rib injury last week and having to leave the game, and obviously Justin Fields is still rehabbing from his left shoulder injury that he suffered two weeks ago, with both of those guys probably being out, is this going to be a Jordan Love versus Nathan Peterman matchup? That sounds nasty, right? It doesn't sound visually appealing to watch, but either way, you know, neither of these teams can stop the run, which helps these backup quarterbacks. Chicago has allowed about 100 
and 50 plus yards a game rushing the last two weeks, while the Packers have been almost like the Packers are, are so bad at, at run defense. I thought the Browns were right, but the Packers are dead last in the league at stopping the run the last two weeks. They've allowed over 225 yards a week. This game should arguably this this should be an ugly game. I'll put it that way. This should be an ugly game at Soldier Field, but I believe in Jordan Love more than Nathan Peterman. No surprise there, right? Uh, for Jordan Love, for those that don't know, I know a lot of close friends to me know, he was my favorite quarterback, believe it or not, in that draft class, uh, which might sound crazy, <laughs> but he, he has shown flashes when he has had the opportunity, and w- when you sit under Aaron Rodgers for three years, I can only... Imagine that your IQ and your decision-making has gotten better, which was one of the biggest question marks for Jordan Love coming out of Utah State. So it would be interesting to see him here if he were to get the start. Um, I think this game, if Jordan Love were to start, if let's just say Green Bay comes out and they look good running the ball, passing the ball, I won't go as far as, as to say that Jordan Love just takes Aaron Rodgers' position Let's be real. That that's <laughs> Aaron Rodgers is a multiple-time MVP. He's a golden golden jacket player, first ballot Hall of Famer. Whenever he decides to hang it up, but I believe when it gets to the offseason, even though Aaron Rodgers just signed a massive contract, if Jordan Love, if they believe it's time, I would not be surprised. The Packers go a different direction, but give me Green Bay on the road if it's Aaron Rodgers. If it's Jordan Love at quarterback, it doesn't matter. I like both quarterbacks against Chicago. Even if Jordan, even if Justin Fields were to come back with Darnell Mooney being out for the year, Chicago's just not going to have enough to keep up with Green Bay. Next up, we're going to have the four and seven Pittsburgh Steelers uh, heading into Atlanta to take on the five and seven Atlanta Falcons. The Falcons, they're coming off of a loss to the Washington Commanders last week who, I'll say this before I forget it, the Commanders, since week six, have the best record in the NFL. I believe they're 6-1, and one. so that's just a crazy stat I saw. Um, shout out to the Commanders, we'll get into them a little bit later. But for this matchup, the Falcons are coming off of a loss to the Commanders, making, that, making the Falcons losers of the last three of the last four games. I can't talk, stick with me. But in their last four games, which they've lost three, the Falcons have only averaged about 17-ish for rounding up 18 points a game. And obviously that's not a recipe for success, especially when you're giving up about 23 points a game defensively. So what does that tell me, right? They're, They're scoring 18 and they're giving up 23 points a game. That tells me their offense is terrible and or it it can't keep up, right? Since losing the greatest decoy ever, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, we're talking about Kyle Pitts, obviously. Since the Falcons offense has lost Kyle Pitts, their offense has somehow looked worse. <laughs> even though they're only going even though they only sit one game out of the playoffs, especially with the Buccaneers being so wishy-washy. They only sit one game out, and I think Arthur Smith coach of the Atlanta Falcons, I believe, even though they sit one game out, if they were to lose this game, let's say, I believe they I, they really think they need to give Desmond Ritter a shot. The experiment with Marcus Mariota has been cool, but for a team like the Falcons, who obviously on paper, they don't have enough to compete, you need to look to the future, let Desmond Ritter get some touches, and let him find a rhythm maybe before he takes over next season. But for Pittsburgh, they're coming off of a tough Monday night uh, loss to the Colts. Obviously, they had a lead late, and the Colts ended up finishing the game. But that, of course, means that they're on a, on a short week, not as much rest as, let's say, the Falcons. But for Pittsburgh, their offense has looked better. You know, the, the two-glove quarterback and Kenny Pickett, he has, uh, I won't say made a believer out of me, but he's definitely surprised me, right? I... Did not believe in him at all uh, coming out of college, but he's looked okay. You know, he's looked okay. And for George Pickens, he's looked like the best receiver on that team. 
even though they do have Deontay Johnson. It looks like George Pickens has already taken over the realm as the number one receiver. Look for Deontay Johnson to explore free agency. That, that's just what Pittsburgh does, right? They never sign their guys back. But I expect the defense of the Steelers with TJ Watt having another week under him to pull this one out on the road against Atlanta. Next up, we have Mike White and the 7-4 New York Jets going into Minnesota to take on the 9-2 Minnesota Vikings. The Jets got back on track last week, like I said, with Mike White at quarterback. And <laughs> though it was against the Jets, it was still or though it was against the Bears with no Justin Fields, it was still impressive for the Jets, right? Um, but I, I believe that that win last week almost solidifies that Zach Wilson will be getting the Josh Rosen treatment. And he will be getting replaced in the offseason. That or he will just be benched for the foreseeable future. Watch out, Carolina. That, that's what I got to say about that. You, Zach Wilson might be Carolina's next starting quarterback. And it wouldn't, it, I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me, right? But for the Vikings, they also recalibrated. <laughs> big word there. But they also recalibrated with a Thanksgiving victory against Bill Belichick in New England. Um, this matchup here, the biggest thing I'd be looking out for, because obviously I have a clear-cut winner in this matchup, the biggest thing here I'll be looking out for is the Justin Jefferson versus Sauce Gardner matchup. Uh, <laughs> that matchup alone is worth the ticket that you would be paying to watch the game live. But I just believe Minnesota has so many other options. They have too much talent compared to this Jets team. And that's just going to do it for Minnesota. I'm looking for Dalvin Cook to probably have a two-touchdown game, even though the Jets do have a good run defense. Minnesota gets it done on the ground at home against this Jets team. Next up, we have a matchup of two four and seven teams. The Jacksonville Jaguars head into Detroit to take on the Lions. Uh, both of these teams are coming off of exciting weeks, I will say that. And in a way... They have left hope for their cities, <laughs> maybe not for this season, but for the future. Uh, but yes, Jacksonville, had, we'll start with Jacksonville, they're the road team. They pulled off a crazy comeback last week against the Ravens, I believe overcoming a nine-point deficit with under four minutes to go. So classic Ravens there, at least for this season. And uh, shout out to Zay Jones. <laughs> uh, speaking for fantasy sake here, he's been sitting on my bench in a lot of leagues for the majority of the season <laughs> because he's just good enough to stay on your team, but you don't want to drop him, right? That, that happens every year with a couple players. But last week he had 11 catches, I believe 145 yards and a touchdown. So big, big week for Zay Jones. And he really helped them come back and, and, and get the much needed victory. But for Detroit, they're coming off of a Thanksgiving day loss against the Bills at home. Um, and, and they played great throughout the entire game. You know, I said it was going to be the game of the day and it was, I, I believe that was the best Thanksgiving game that we saw. Right. But I think that watching that Thanksgiving game kind of solidifies for me. Unfortunately, it, it's very weird, right? DeAndre Swift, who on paper is the Lions starter each and every week. It almost looks like he's getting pushed ultimately to the third back in the system. I know that uh, they have a running back by committee over there, but to see J.C. Jackson and Jamal Williams get more touches than DeAndre Swift for the entire game, that's kind of crazy, right? So that's just something to look out for. Maybe he's still dealing with the injury that he had a couple weeks back. Who knows? But uh, with both of these teams being 2-5, and five, in games decided by seven points or less. Something's got to give here. I believe this game will be close. I'm sticking with the home team in Detroit. Look for this offense to probably win by two scores. Um, so, yeah, I'm taking Detroit here over Jacksonville at home. Next up, we have probably the game of the week, at least on paper, <laughs> the game of the week. It We have the 7-4 and four Tennessee Titans going into Philly to take on the 10-1 and one Eagles. Um, it's the A.J. Brown game. <laughs> yeah, if you're not familiar, the Eagles star receiver, A.J. Brown, as most know, was acquired during the NFL draft this previous April. 
via a trade with Tennessee. Obviously, A.J. Brown was drafted and started his career with Tennessee. He was a great receiver. So it was shocking to see Tennessee trade him to Philadelphia. And to no one's surprise, (laughs) A.J. Brown has been a difference maker for Jalen Hurts and the Eagles. He has added a different element to this team, and it's done wonders, right? They're 10-1 for a reason. But even though A.J. Brown has put up okay numbers, you know, in the last couple weeks, really, the last month or so, he's put up okay numbers. Um, I believe he's going to be force-fed in this game, to no one's surprise. And I believe he probably ends up with over 100 yards, maybe a touchdown or two. Uh, the Eagles, when they get in the red zone, they're, they're going to want to get A.J. Brown the ball against his former team. But now for Tennessee, I believe that they can keep this game relatively close with Derrick Henry. Um, Obviously, he's arguably the best running back in the NFL, and they're going up against an Eagles defense, which if they do have one flaw, it is that they can't stop the run at times, right? So if the Titans can get the run going, which we know they're going to try and do uh, adamantly at that too, (laughs) Um, if they can get the run going and effectively, they're going to give Philly some issues here, especially with time management. But with the lack of receiving options for Tennessee, coincidentally, I believe that that's going to show and show mightily here in this matchup on the road in Philly. Eagles stay hot. Give me the Eagles at home. They improve to 11 and 1. <laughs> that's kind of crazy. Excuse me. Um, next up, we're going to have the maybe the game with the most eyes on it. Right, the four and seven Cleveland Browns going into Houston to take on the one nine and one Texans. Like I said, all eyes are going to be on this matchup, but there's not much to say about the game <laughs> uh, specifically, in my opinion. Yeah, you know, for the Browns, Deshaun Watson obviously returns from his 11 game suspension. Coincidentally, who would have thought he's facing his former team in his return? Uh, We'll have to see how big of a distraction that will be for the Browns, who are coming off of an impressive overtime win against the Buccaneers last week, which, as as a Browns fan, it was fun to watch. It was fun to watch. But I will say about midway through that game, I was talking about this with my dad and my brother. CBS was, I believe, the carrier of the game. They showed a graphic, and in short, the Browns are undefeated. When Nick Chubb gets 20 plus touches a game, right? So when Nick Chubb gets 20 plus touches, the Browns are undefeated. (laughs) So for one, it's crazy to me that he hasn't had that every single game this season. He is our best offensive player when Watson is not out there, right? But regardless of the stat for two, that should continue in this matchup to no one's surprise with Watson getting his feet back under him. I believe that Nick Chubb should get a healthy dose on the ground. And ultimately, I I don't think Watson's going to come out and have four or five passing touchdowns, have this explosive game that we would love to see as Brown fans. I believe it'll be a dominated game by Nick Chubb, especially saying that Houston can't stop anybody, right? But for Houston, uh, there's not much to say. Uh, For this matchup, we know the Browns have struggled to stop the run this season. And we've had a lot of defensive miscues, a lot of tackling issues. So the Texans can look forward to that, especially with their best player being Damian Pierce, which is the Texans running back. So I believe Damian Pierce will probably have a lot of touches in this ball game. However, uh, <laughs> the last two weeks, they've only averaged 23 rushing yards a game. That's not, that's not for uh, just one player. That's not for just last week. It's the last two weeks they've only averaged 23 rushing yards a game. So that actually helps the Browns out because the Browns can't stop the run. But as a Browns fan, I know if they were to get it going, it would be this week. So we'll have to see how long the Texans can keep up with the Browns scoring. And if they can take down their former quarterback, give me the Browns on the road. No shocker there. Next up, we have an NFC East matchup. Big, big playoff implication matchup here. We have the 7-5 Washington Commanders 
heading into New York to take on the 7-4 and four Giants. So, like I said, this is a, a surprising pivotal game at this point in the season in the NFC Wild Card race. Obviously, neither of these teams, in my opinion, will catch Philadelphia, but that's no surprise. For New York, we'll start with them, actually. They're coming off of a Thanksgiving loss to the Cowboys. Uh, they've now lost three of their last four games, and they have failed with Saquon Barkley in their backfield and Brian Dayball being a running head coach. They have failed to get 100 rushing yards in three of those last of th- in three of these last four games, right? So they've struggled offensively. That's the, been the biggest reason why they're three and four. But for Washington, they've been rolling. <laughs> like I said, they are six and one. Um, since week six, they have the best record in the NFL since that point, tied with the Eagles, I believe. But they won again again. They won again last week against Atlanta. They're now five and one with Taylor Heineke at the starting quarterback position. It's his position to lose at this point, right? I believe, like I said last week, Heineke's going to have it for the remainder of the season. You know, win or lose, I don't believe they want to go back to Carson Wentz. And hey, <laughs> it's been working for him, right? Taylor Heineke has been getting them the much needed wins that they have right now. But for Washington, their defense has been amazing throughout this three game winning streak that they're on. And I believe in this game. Shocker, maybe. Washington keeps it rolling. <laughs> they keep it rolling. They go and win four straight in New York against the Giants. Some questions start to uh, boil over there in New York on if they're real contenders, right? Next up, we have a quick matchup, but the 3-8 and Denver Broncos going to Baltimore to take on the 7-4 and Baltimore Ravens. Uh, we'll start with the Ravens here. Obviously, they're more interesting to talk about. The Ravens lost in stunning fashion last week against the Jaguars. Obviously, like I said, they blew a nine-point lead in four with four or so minutes to go. So disappointing loss for them. But on the plus side, <laughs> they have bounced back with victories. I was looking at their schedule. They have won after every single loss this season. So they bounce back the week after with a win every single time this season. So, hey, you're at home here against the Broncos. That trend should continue. But Lamar Jackson, he should be able to pick his spots against Denver, be able to do whatever he wants. We should be able to see Mark Andrews get more involved in the passing game. And J.K. Dobbins, I think, is slated to return. So that'll be interesting to see. Um, also, it's also good to see that De- Deshaun Jackson's back on the field. <laughs> he's back on the field. He's playing football. He had like a 70-yard catch last week, which he seems to get one of those every single season. But regardless, he got that 70-yard catch last season or last week. And I don't know. Even though this offense has struggled a lot, they're getting some pieces back. And it should be interesting to see where the biggest flaw for this Ravens offense is when it when it gets down to the nitty gritty when they're playing competitive football teams. For Denver, they're coming off of a loss to Carolina, and that's all I'll say about that. Sam Darnold was apparently the missing ingredient for the Carolina Panthers. But for Denver, they, the the tail of the tape for Denver is this: you know they have the the number one scoring defense. They have the worst scoring offense. That is the tail of the tape for Denver <laughs> and that Broncos team. So even though they have Russell Wilson, Cortland Sutton, Jerry Judy, they had Javante Williams. Obviously, he got hurt. That's not his fault. Uh, rest up, Javante. But they have this talented offensive crew with an offensive-minded head coach. And come to find out, They have the best defense in the NFL, (laughs) but the worst scoring offense doesn't make any sense, right? But one thing they've been able to hang their hats on lately is they're able to force turnovers. You know, throughout this entire season, they've been able to force those turnovers to score the touchdowns, right? But that even hasn't happened in the last couple weeks. So the Broncos have been struggling both sides of the ball all around, I believe, Give me, you know, I'll put it this way. Give me Baltimore at home to get back on track and continue to bounce back with wins after their losses. Next up, we have probably the game of the week. This is another game in contention. 
We have the 8-3 Miami Dolphins going into San Francisco to take on the 7-4 San Francisco Niners. Um, this game, like I said, it's in contention for the game of the week. Uh, Mike McDaniel and the, and the high-powered Miami offense, they're on the road against his former mentor in Kyle Shanahan. <laughs> and uh, both teams are hot. You know, both teams are hot. Miami's on a five-game win streak. San Fran is on a four-game win streak. Um, the Niners are going to look to slow down the Dolphins passing attack in this, in this game, which the Dolphins have the second best passing offense in the NFL. I feel like this game though, though it has all the potential in the world to be a super high scoring game. I believe it's going to be dominated by the, by each team's biggest trade deadline acquisition for San Fran. That would be Christian McCaffrey. And for the Dolphins, I believe it would be Bradley Chubb. Um, I believe both both of those guys are going to have a great day from the field. I believe it's going to be a low-scoring game. The Dolphins are going to pull it out late, right? But the question is, looking at how hot these teams are and how good they've looked, is this a potential Super Bowl preview? <laughs> I believe it's definitely not a favorite pick, right? Because you do have teams like the Chiefs and like Philly. but. This could be a, a potential Super Bowl matchup. Nobody thought since he would get there last year, and look where we were, look where we were at, right? But give me Miami on the road. Next up, we're gonna have the the six and five Seattle Seahawks going into Los Angeles to take on the three and eight Rams. Uh, we'll make this one quick. You know, Seattle let one slip away last week in overtime last week. Um, to Josh Jacobs, <laughs> but they can bounce back here against the struggling Rams with Aaron Donald and with, well, obviously the Rams have multiple injuries. Cooper Cup's out for the remainder of the year. Uh, Matthew Stafford and Aaron Donald, which are arguably the two most impactful players on this Rams team, they're still both going to be out with a concussion. So we're going to see another Bryce Perkins game, which will be good for Bryce Perkins, right? Get him some more reps, especially with Stafford getting up there in age. But regardless, the Rams just don't have enough. Seattle gets a much-needed divisional win here on the road to bounce back from that loss in overtime. Next up, we have an AFC West matchup. The 6-5 and five Chargers going into uh, Las Vegas to take on the 4-7 and seven Raiders. The Chargers won a wild game. <laughs> between these two teams in week one and round two. This this is round two. It seems to be just as entertaining, right? It's lining up that way at least. But the Raiders, uh, they have won, excuse me, they've, they've won two in a row on Josh Jacobs' back. Obviously, he had that 65-yard run um, to close out the game last week. Regardless, the last two meetings in Las Vegas between these two teams were both overtime games. <laughs> Obviously. Uh, last season we had the big debacle with both teams could have made the playoffs in week 18, but the Chargers called a timeout and pretty much ruined their season. Back to this matchup. With, with both of these teams playing very up and down this season, I could really, I could really see another overtime game, which would be the, the Raiders fourth this season, <laughs> which is crazy to say. But I'm, I'm going for the upset here. I'm going for the upset here. Give me Las Vegas at home to keep rolling. And they're going to make the tail end of this AFC playoff picture. Um, very interesting. You know, very interesting. And though I don't believe in um, Josh McDaniels as a coach at all, I believe in the talent that they have, right, on both sides of the ball. Next up, next 4 o'clock game could also be a game of the week. Do you see the trend here? We have a great week of football lined up in week 13. We have the Tennessee-Philly game. We have some divisional games lined up. We have a KC-Cincy. And then we have a, uh, oh, what was the matchup? Just Miami and San Fran. So we have a great week of football lined up. Should be, I can't wait, put it that way. But like I said, for this matchup, we have the 9-2 Kansas City Chiefs going into Cincy to take on the 7-4 hot Bengals. Uh, this game, to me, highlights the question of, well, obviously there's history between these two teams in the last couple years, right? 
But who has more to prove in this game? Who who like who does this game mean more to? Right? You know, obviously in last year's AFC Championship game, uh, Championship game, excuse me, the Bengals shocked the world, <laughs> and most importantly, they shocked the Chiefs. You know, uh, winning the AFC, obviously they would go on to lose the Super Bowl, but they still beat the Chiefs, and they made it. That they were the AFC champs, right? We'll put it that way. But for this matchup alone, the Bengals could get in the mix for the AFC uh, for home home field advantage. We'll put it that way, because the Chiefs would drop to nine and three. The Cincy the Cincinnati Bengals go to eight and four. The Bengals don't have the hardest schedule left, so they could they could easily get into the playoff picture and the home field advantage picture with this win here. The Bengals, they've won three straight games without their arguably their best player in Jamar Chase, and they're going to get him back here <laughs> in Week 13. Jamar Chase is coming back from his, uh, I believe, I forget the injury, but he'll be back. Oh, not to mention, uh, <laughs> last year when these two teams played in the regular season game, it was before Thanksgiving, I want to say. Regardless, when these two teams played in the regular season last year, Jamar Chase had 266 receiving yards in that game. So not the AFC Championship game, but the regular season game they had last year, almost 270 receiving yards for Jamar Chase, which, like I said, they get him back here. For the Chiefs, they come in as road favorites, no surprise there. Um, given how the AFC Championship game finished last season, you can imagine they're going to come into this game with a chip on their shoulder. They're going to feel like they have something to prove here, saying that they've lost the last two games to this Bengals team. Um, but for the Chiefs, they're first in the conference. They've been for a couple weeks now. Uh, I, I would hope in, for this matchup to turn out to be a high-scoring affair like the regular season game was last season. But unfortunately, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I, I, I think that this will be a a 21-20, 24-20 type of game, um, lower scoring for these two teams' standards. But I believe the Chiefs finally get their win, third time's the charm on the road here in Cincinnati. Give me the Chiefs. Next up uh, for Sunday Night Football, we're going to have the 4-7-1 Colts going into Dallas to take on the 8-3 Dallas Cowboys. Um, but though this is a Sunday Night Football game, <laughs> we shouldn't have to spend too much time on it. Uh, the Cowboys are heavy favorites at home, and for good reason. Uh, the Cowboys love to run the football, play very physical defense, in-your-face style of defense. And this game allows them to play to their strengths. It, it, it allows them to do just that, right? Uh, for offense, Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard, they're going to be able to feast against a middle-of-the-pack um, Indianapolis run defense. and. <laughs> on defense, with Matt Ryan being a statue in the pocket, obviously he doesn't have much mobility to his game. They're going to be able to play the <laughs> Dan Quinn. I'll put it this way. If you're unfamiliar, Dan Quinn, obviously he was the coach of the Falcons for a long time. But Dan Quinn, he loves to play a man blitz style of defense, right? So that's just, we're going we're gonna to put seven or eight guys in the box. We're going to man up your receivers, and we're just going to make the quarterback throw the ball quickly, right? So with Matt Ryan being a statue, meaning, meaning that he doesn't move much, he doesn't have much mobility to his game to make the defense harder, or to make it harder for the defense, right? And with Michael Pittman being the, real, the only real receiving option in Indy, I expect Dallas is going to dominate this game, <laughs> uh, the, you know, to say the least. But for the Colts, you know, they, they've shown fight under the interim head coach in Jeff Saturday. They just don't have enough here. And they're not, unless they get the run going early and often, maybe have a couple big splash plays, I don't see this game to be much of one. Give me Dallas at home for Sunday night football. Moving on to Monday night, this is the last game. Uh, this is an NFC South matchup here on Monday night football. And in a way, it could be a very sad game to watch. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. But for the Bucs, uh, they're home here. Despite the embarrassing loss to the Browns last week, one, I, uh, I'm sure Tom Brady is embarrassed because he lost to a poverty franchise. 
but they, they shouldn't have lost that game anyway, right? They, they had all of the opportunity in the world. We're starting a backup quarterback in Jacoby Brissett. The Bucs still couldn't get it done. But despite the loss, they still maintain the lead in their division. And it'll be interesting to see the timeshare this week between their rookie, Rashad White, who had an amazing game last week, and Leonard Fournette, who is a veteran. He's coming off of an injury. And he's been their starter for the last year and a half or so. So it'll be interesting to see the timeshare between the two backs. But for the Saints, they, they've been a headache for Tom Brady, to say the least, in, uh, in his time with Tampa Bay. Uh, excuse me here. <laughs> we'll get back on track. The Tom Brady, when, since he's been with Tampa Bay and the Bucks, he has had six straight losses to the Saints team. Can you believe that? Obviously, we're talking about regular season here because in Drew Brees' final year, uh, the Bucs beat the Saints in the playoffs. Obviously, the Bucs would go on to win the Super Bowl. But they've had six straight regular season losses. You know, for the Saints, I expect Kamara to have a better game than he's had as of late. But we never know with Andy Dalton at quarterback. Uh, it's a heated rivalry. And <laughs> it, it's a guy to have a game for the Bucs. You know, obviously the Saints, even though they're, they're technically only one game out, nobody expects them to do anything but tank for the rest of the year. They're obviously, they, they've made it clear that they're going to tank. But for the Bucs, it's a got to have a game for them. You know, obviously it's Super Bowl or bust season for them. And we know at some point in this game, <laughs> Marshawn Lattimore and Mike Evans, they're going to end up getting in a fight. And they're both going to get injected or get get some detrimental penalties for their team at some point. It, I, I don't want to I don't want to hope that athletes fight right, but every single time these two line up, there's some type of altercation. And at this point, it, it would be dumb to bet against it, <laughs> right? But in short, I believe Brady delivers on what could be his final Monday night football game, which is the sad part. And I believe he gets the Bucks on track here, picks up the win on Monday night. On the screen now, you're going to have my recap of the picks for this week. And on the left side of your screen, you're going to see my record for last week and my overall season record. Um, last week, like I said, we killed it. 16 games total. Every team played. We had a, out of 16 games, we had a 13-3 and record. So we killed it last week. Um, on the season, out of 100 games, we've gotten about 59 right. So not exactly where we want to be. I would like to at least be in the 60 percentile. But we're going to get there this week, right? I'm not going to get any wrong, right? <laughs> but right now, we're 59 to 41. 59 percent of the games I've predicted so far um, since the start of this podcast have been right. So I somewhat know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but yes, last week we killed it. I don't expect us to ever top a 13-3 and record, but I'm hoping for it. I'm optimistic. But that's going to do it for today's show. Um, I will see you guys on Tuesday, but big, big announcement here. We talked about it at the end of the last episode. For next Tuesday's show, um, I want to do another fan-led show. I said I was going to do one once a month, but this time I want to do it a little differently. Last time, it was more so of a hot take, what do you believe fan episode. This time, I want to do more so like a Q&A style of podcast, right? A Q&A style of show. I understand there's a lot of people out there that I do know on a personal note. But a lot of you guys out there, I can see, uh, I've never met before. I've, I don't know you guys on a personal level. So if you want to reach out, Please do. <laughs> Please do. Um, if you want to drop your questions on yesterday's video, uh, under today's video, if you want to go to the U uh, YouTube, my YouTube community section on my channel, you can drop your question there. Or if you have my personal number or any of my personal contact information, you can do it there. Or on the screen now, you have my Instagram account. If you want to go over there and drop a question in my DMs, whatever works for you, right? There, there's multiple, multiple ways to drop me a question for next Tuesday's show. I expect a lot more participation <laughs> for next Tuesday, saying how excited everyone was after um, the first fan-led show, right? I, I love to get you guys involved. I love to 
uh, see what you guys are thinking. My only request would be to keep keep these kind of sports related, right? Because I don't I don't want to to not that it's not a a super serious question, right? But I would prefer not to come up to the podcast answering what is my favorite color. If you're wondering, it's green, right? No explanation why. I just like the color. But I would prefer not to answer what my favorite color is, what my favorite shape is, what my birthday is, what my social security number is, that stuff, right? (laughs) Obviously, the last one was extreme. But if you want to ask me, hey, who do you think is better, this guy or this guy? Who do you think is better? Or or what do you think the outlook is for this team or this team? Or if you want to give me a hypothetical situation, right? You could be like, well, if this player doesn't turn out this way, what are your thoughts on whatever, right? There's, there's, there's millions and millions of hypothetical situations you could throw at me. And this is your opportunity to show. <laughs> Obviously, I'm going to give everybody a shout out. And unless you prefer not to, um, I'm going to give everybody a shout out that does partake in next Tuesday's show. So get at me. You have until Monday to get those submissions in. But that's going to do it for today's show. I know I just did a lot of talking, but but please, if you want to get involved, I'm here for it. Everybody's going to have a chance. <laughs> There's no limit. But that's going to do it for today's show. I will see you guys on Tuesday. Peace, love, and hugs. Stay safe out there. Get better if you do have the flu or if you're feeling bad. Do what you got to do to get healthy. I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Peace, love, and hugs. I'm out.